So what tools should we consider, should we include when we think about how to manage climate risks? I want to make the case that we should consider solar geoengineering, the idea that humans might deliberately alter the planet's reflectivity to reduce some of the risks of accumulated carbon dioxide. Unlike many of the other talks you've heard today, this is not entrepreneurial. Indeed, I think private company action here should be discouraged. And it's also not really innovative. The ideas I'm going to tell you about go back to the 1960s. Three important takeaways right at the beginning. One, at best, solar geoengineering is a supplement to cutting emissions, not a substitute for cutting them. If you want a stable climate, you have to bring net emissions to zero. Nothing I will tell you about solar geoengineering changes that in any way. Second, it would be reckless to talk now about deploying these technologies. I think the hard question, the conversation I'm trying to start, is about whether or not we should have a serious research program, a research program that tries to understand what the risks are, how effective these technologies would be in reducing climate risks we actually care about, how we might make these technologies work better, have less risk, and most of all, how we would govern them in a divided world. Third, governance and this research enterprise have to co-evolve. Both depend on the other. So how would we actually make the Earth more reflective? The easiest way is probably to put aerosols, tiny particles which float in the air, into the upper atmosphere, say 20 kilometers above our head. This could be done with modified uh, commercial aircraft. And whether or not you think this idea is nuts, whatever you think about the wisdom of it, it appears to be a fact that it could be done using essentially off-the-shelf technology today in a crude and, and way I think is inadvisable, but it could be done in such a way as to say limit or stop uh, a global average warming over this century at a cost that's just a few billion dollars a year. Whether that is a feature or a bug is unclear. It is a bug to the extent that it makes unilateral action more easy. The idea that humans put aerosols, put these fine particles in the atmosphere, and that changes the climate is happening now. Uh, all our industrial action, our burning of fossil fuels around the planet, puts aerosol pollution in the lower atmosphere where we live, which kills order a few million people a year. Uh, and that aerosol pollution is also reflecting sunlight back to space and masking some of the warming from the CO2. So the climate warming we're seeing now is not the full consequences of our actions in burning all those fossil fuels over the last century or two. We're masking some of it already by reflecting away sunlight from, with aerosols. And it appears to be true that if one were to do solar geoengineering in the stratosphere, the, uh, you could achieve the same amount of cooling as, for example, we do now with more than 1,000 times less health impacts. So it is true, I think, it, it really not an overstatement to say you could use these technologies to, with confidence, hold global temperatures under, say, the 1.5 target uh, that was a stretch goal at Paris. But that's kind of an oversell or overstatement because actually um, global average temperature is just a proxy for the climate risks we really care about. And while these technologies can certainly do global average temperature, the question is how much they actually reduce the risks we care about, the individual risks. And for that, we have to turn to climate models and, and, and to natural analogs. The answers depend on the questions we ask. If we ask, uh, about the response to pretty uniform solar geoengineering that is covering the whole world in a pretty even-handed way. And if we ask about solar geoengineering, which is in a sense moderate, that is being used not as a substitute for emissions uh, uh, reductions, but as a complement to them, as a way to take the edge off the worst effects, then um, climate models, indeed really all the major models, uh, suggest that for the big variables that matter, extreme temperatures, extreme storms, temperature, changes in aridity, precipitation minus evaporation, for all those variables on a region by region basis, in really almost all cases, solar geoengineering pushes uh, the climate back towards the pre-industrial. That is, it does counteract successfully the uh, uh, risks from increasing carbon dioxide. That's quite a stunning fact. Should you believe it? Is it true? Uh, do we believe those climate models? Hard to know. They're the same climate models we rely on to judge the risks of accumulating carbon dioxide. So there's no way to get out of depending on those models. It's a risk-to-risk -risk choice.
I didn't mention ocean acidification, but it turns out that also is something where solar geoengineering can be surprisingly partially effective. To be clear, in the end, we have to bring emissions to zero. But if we emit carbon, that puts more carbon in the atmosphere. More carbon in the atmosphere makes it warmer. When it's warmer, uh, less carbon is absorbed by the oceans. And also, uh, for example, the permafrost may emit more carbon. These are all things that are called carbon cycle feedbacks. And they make the warming and the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere at the end of the century larger than it would be without the carbon cycle feedbacks. And what that means is for a given amount of human emissions of carbon from industry, if we do solar geoengineering, we reduce those feedbacks because it doesn't warm so much. And that means there's less carbon in the atmosphere at the end of the century. This won't solve that problem. It's a sort of 20% helper. But 20% is not nothing. That's like US emissions over the century uh, uh, at very low cost. So let's take a step back. How should we think about deliberately altering the natural world in, 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 at this scale? Um, we're already altering the natural world, but not deliberately, and that matters. I don't have any perfect answer, and for me, the answer, like for all of us, I think, is ultimately personal. But I can give you some insight into how I think about it by saying that I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time in some of the places that will be most affected by climate change, some of the wild parts of the world. These images you're seeing are not stock photography. Actually, if you look closely, there's the tent that my uh, wife and I spent two weeks of our honeymoon two years ago in. Um, so let's think about, uh, sorry, sorry, I want to first say, let's ask why it's been so extraordinarily hard to break the taboo, to get this conversation happening, to have these technologies be seriously addressed in the center of climate policy. Why do thoughtful leaders on climate change like Al Gore argue that, um, that it's ludicrous or insane or reckless to even have conversations like this? I don't think the answer is a list of physical risks. Yes, there are a series of physical risks to solar geoengineering, no question. But those risks, I think, from or, or, or we can research and appear in many ways manageable. I think the central underlying concern is a well-founded political fear. And let me put it in the most personal terms. I anticipate, I expect, that uh, forces that want to fight emissions cuts, big oil, oil-rich nations, will exploit talk of solar geoengineering, including talks like I'm giving you here, as a false argument against cutting emissions. And I think it's that fear, a fear that's often called the moral hazard, that is the underlying fear that's made it so hard to talk about this. And I think that fear is entirely well-founded. So why am I still up here talking about it? Because I think that ultimately the grand battle we've been part of between those of us who want to cut emissions uh, uh, quickly and, and those who resist, that battle won't fundamentally change by talking about this openly. And I think in the end, we do better having things out in the open than otherwise. Um, so. How might this fit into climate policy? We have to think, first of all, about what happens if we were to do nothing. So fossil fuels forever means the carbon just builds up in the atmosphere and the climate risk grows without bound. If we bring emissions to zero, we um, stop the climate problem getting worse. But that's not the same as making it better. So it's very different uh, climate from air pollution. Air pollution, you stop the pollutants and the problem is gone in a week uh, for climate. If we stop emitting, all we do is stop making the problem worse. We can remove carbon from the atmosphere. And I think there's no question it's doable, but it's inherently slow and expensive. And I think it does little to manage the peak period of climate risk that will happen this century. Solar geoengineering could be used to reduce that peak risk. But remember, that's solar geoengineering in combination with emissions cuts and carbon removal. Solar geoengineering alone doesn't do it. So, how to think about the trade-off of having a serious research program. Here's a kind of technocratic, a, a, a geeky decision tree way to think about it. So we're deciding now, collectively, whether to have a serious research program. I hope it will be international, open access, non-commercial, multidisciplinary. If we have such a research program, we'll learn something. And maybe we'll learn that the risks are bigger than we thought, that it doesn't work very well, in which case we're really not much worse off. Maybe we'll learn that, as appears to be true, it really can reduce risks a lot, albeit not perfectly, in which case then we, or really our children, have the hard choice about how to use these technologies. But I don't think that doing the research prejudges that choice. I think it just informs that choice. And it's important to say that if we have no research program, we can't uninvent this idea. 
And some nations are going to face enormous climate stress over the next half century. And they will, I think, almost inevitably consider this idea whether or not there is a serious research program. And if there's not, they're going to make an uninformed decision, a decision without monitoring and without the ability to know more and to reduce the overall risks. So to summarize, solar geoengineering, if it is used as an excuse to forego emissions cuts, if it is used in ways that are really unequal, could have profoundly negative consequences. If it's used wisely, it appears possible that it could dramatically reduce total climate risk over this century in ways that cannot be done by emissions cuts alone. Uh, reduce risk that fall to rich places like San Francisco and to some of the poorest, most vulnerable places to, uh, around the world, and also to places like this. Uh, this is a picture I took from a kayak in, in Antarctica. I think we should have a research program, and I think its central goal is to give our children the chance to make better decisions. And that's really all we can do. We can't bind their hands about what decision to make, but we can give them more information about ways they might protect their planet and about what the downsides of those ways might be. Thank you.